Have you heard about coenzyme Q10 and how it relates to statins? It's one of the most common subjects I've been asked to comment on lately. Well, recently I took a journey down that rabbit hole and in this video, I'll go over what I found. Stay tuned. Well, the first thing you might want to know is what is a coenzyme? Well, it's an organic molecule that assists in some reaction within the body. It acts as a catalyst. CoQ10 in particular was first described in 1955 and it was named ubiquitous quinone. Ubiquitous meaning everywhere. And I believe the Q from quinone, not from ubiquitous, is where we get the Q in CoQ10. For those of you interested in the biochemical structure, you can see it in this picture here. You see a bracketed area in the lower right. That is a part that can be repeated many times and you'll see the 10 there circled in green. That is where we get CoQ10. It's a coenzyme quinone and there are 10 instances. There are CoQ6, CoQ7, CoQ, I've seen references up to CoQ11 in different species and probably within human biology, different places. So what reactions are we talking about? Well, CoQ10 is essential to the aerobic respiration within mitochondria. Mitochondria, as you may remember from high school biology, are found in most human cells, the main exception being red blood cells, and they're nicknamed the powerhouse of the cells. The more energy a particular organ uses, the more mitochondria it has in it. So CoQ10 is really important to the normal function of mitochondria, and a lack of CoQ10 will affect the mitochondria. So where do we get CoQ10? You've probably seen this diagram before. It is the biochemical pathways that lead to the production of cholesterol, cholesterol down there at the bottom. Along that chain, off to the side, circled in green, is a reference to ubiquinon, which is CoQ10. So there's endogenous, which means we make it within our body. And then another source is exogenous, meaning from the outside, and that's obviously from your diet or supplements. So briefly, let's look at CoQ10 and aging. Well, CoQ10 levels decrease with age. You'll see here, and this is per gram, there are a certain number of micrograms per gram in our heart tissues, as an example. Reaches its peak around 20 or 21, falls off rapidly for the next 20 years, and then a little more slowly, until we get into our 80s. So by the time we're 80, the amount of CoQ10 that we have in our tissues is about half of what it was in our 20s. So I found this paper called CoQ10 and Aging, and I'll put a link to it in the copyrights and everything into the description. And I used this as a, a good roadmap. It was 16 solid pages of information, and then 163 more references if I wanted to chase down things. So you might wanna actually take a look at that if you get into this sort of thing. So here are some observations from that paper, and this is necessarily cherry-picked just because it was a large paper, a lot of technical information, and so I just grabbed out the things that jumped out at me. First, ubiquinol is associated with protection of plasma LDL, that's the LDL in our blood, from oxidation, which ends up with this oxidized LDL, which I had said in an earlier video is the one thing that everybody agrees is bad. You don't want oxidized LDL. So ubiquinol, which is a form of CoQ10, protects that. CoQ10 supplementation reduces inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. I don't like the sounds of that last one. Um, I didn't get into a lot of that, but these are factors that indicate you've got inflammation in your body. CoQ10 from dietary intake becomes more important with aging as endogenous production decreases. Now, I wasn't sure why it decreased. I thought maybe we didn't absorb it as well as we got older, but no, this paper indicates that it is the endogenous production that decreases. Well, our cholesterol doesn't specifically decrease, unless we're taking statins, of course. So it makes me wonder if there's more to it than that simplified diagram that I showed earlier. Are there other inputs to the production of CoQ10, or is it just our bodies just don't get as good as synthesizing it? So just something that I've wondered about. So we might wonder where we can get CoQ10 in our diets. Well, trout and herring, chicken legs, and I think they were really meant dark meat, but they specifically said chicken legs in this article. Vegetables and grains, lamb, pork, uh, beef. So basically everywhere, but you notice that these are all whole foods. It is absorbed if we take it through 
either diet or supplementation. It is absorbed in the small intestine three to four times better in the ubiquinol form. There's a ubiquinon form and there's an ubiquinol form. And this is not a sponsored advertisement, but I use uh, the ubiquinol, cunol, uh, CoQ10 supplements. And it's increased, the absorption has increased if it's taken with food. So my research on this for this video actually taught me something because I was taking it wrong. I was taking it at bedtime. Now I'm going to be taking it with meals. So how does CoQ10 get reduced in our bodies? Well, as I talked about, normal aging is the main way. Certain nutritional deficiencies. This paper called out vitamin B6 in particular. I didn't chase down why that would cause it. I just, you know, we'll accept that. Acquired disorders. This was interesting because they listed only one acquired disorder, and that was statin use. So there it is in black and white force. And it also can be reduced uh, in conjunction with or in association with certain medical conditions such as Parkinson's. Now, you might say, oh, I should be out supplementing with CoQ10 if I have Parkinson's. This science wasn't clear that that would be helpful. I don't think it would hurt, but just, you know, don't think of this as a magic bullet for that. So some of the studies that were referenced from within this paper, I did chase down a few of them. Uh, CoQ10 is associated with higher physical activity and lower oxidized LDL, which is consistent with what I said earlier, in the elderly. I object, Your Honor, because they defined in that paper the elderly as being over 50, but we'll let that slide. There were mixed results with highly trained athletes. And that doesn't surprise me because, you know, like these women here, they're all probably in their 20s. They have the maximized uh, use of CoQ10 in their systems. Adding more to it is just not going to do anything to improve their already, you know, great athletic uh, conditioning. So now let's look at statins. Statins are well known to reduce CoQ10 in our bodies. Patients with mitochondrial myopathy don't tolerate statins. And that situation may improve with CoQ10 supplementation. So, um, yeah, there is definitely a connection there. Cardiovascular disease. Well, cardiac function in elderly may be improved with CoQ10 supplementation. There was one meta-analysis, which was not in this paper, but it was referenced in this paper, that showed that CoQ10 increased HDL, lowered total cholesterol, and what seemed like a contradiction to me, did not affect LDL or Triggs. Well, if you have a certain amount of cholesterol, like shown here, and you reduce the total, but increase the HDL, either LDL or Triggs or both must be reduced. I think the problem is when you get group statistics and what is considered uh, statistically significant, edge cases can sometimes get skewed a little and confusing when you're talking about meta-analysis. For an individual, it's obviously the case. If you were to take CoQ10 and it did reduce your cholesterol, I'm not saying it necessarily will, but if it did for you and it raised your HDL, then by definition, your, either your remnant or your LDL or both would go down. And remnant is generally proportional to triglycerides. So the conclusions of the authors of this article in biology is, well, first, it's not known if the reduction of CoQ10 with age is an effect of aging or is it a cause of aging? You know, maybe it's a little bit of both. Some diseases of aging may benefit from supplementing. If we consider that cardiovascular disease a disease of aging, I suppose, well, there's a case where it can help. It, there is a lack of evidence that it slows aging. I, you know, as humans, we're always looking for ways to slow down aging, expecting this pill or that pill to do it, or some of us are, or this diet or that diet. Well, yeah, this isn't a wonder supplement, even though it is useful. So here's my personal conclusions. I think that anybody who's taking a statin should be required to be on a CoQ10 supplement. And that includes anybody taking red yeast rice. As a matter of fact, the first time I'd ever heard of CoQ10 was from the clerk at the vitamin store when I had picked up some red yeast rice. I didn't understand back then that red yeast rice is really just another statin. Somebody at work had said, hey, it works as well. Well, the reason is because it's exactly the same thing. So I don't take that. But I thought it interesting that it was a clerk at the vitamin store who brought my attention to CoQ10 and not my own doctor who later said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Why aren't you telling me these things, doc? For me, the decrease in the inflammatory markers and the impact on the you know, reduction of oxidized LDL combined with my past statin use are sufficient reasons for me to take CoQ10. I don't know if it's undoing any of the damage from 10 years of taking the statins. 
Uh, it's just, it seems prudent to me and it's a well tolerated supplement. You know, I don't go overboard. I don't take mega doses. I just take the recommended dose. I'm just taking it. It just appears prudent to do so. So if you appreciate this comment, please like, share and comment. Tell me your story if you can do it without exposing too much personal information. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.